Hello and welcome to Inspiring Marketing. In this episode, we'll be exploring the threats of ad blocking, not just to advertisers, but also to brands and to the entire advertising industry. Ad blocking has been gaining momentum all over the world over the past few months. So much so that ad blocking could even spell the end of advertising as we know it. Now, that's a fairly dramatic claim to start the episode with. So let me give you some data to back that up. This is a stat from Global Web Index, which is a great resource for understanding how internet use is evolving all over the world. And they're reporting that more than half of all internet users have used ad blocking tools at some point in their lives. And as you can see in this next chart, though, things do vary from country to country. At one end of the spectrum, we've got 68% of internet users in India using ad blockers. But in Japan, that number is just 28%. But the critical finding of this chart is that white bar there in the middle, which shows the global average. And Global Web Index here reporting that almost 60% of internet users around the world have used an ad blocker at some point in time. But it's not just ad blockers that advertisers need to worry about. Global Web Index also found that 70% of us also delete cookies on a regular basis, specifically to stop websites being able to track us and remember our behaviours across multiple visits. But deleting cookies requires quite a bit of effort. So why are internet users so upset about advertising that they go to these lengths just to block ads? Well, that's something that I've been discussing with people all around the world over the past few months, and there have been a few themes that have come through in those conversations. The first issue relates to focus. Most of our web activity is purpose-driven, even if that purpose is just watching the latest kitten videos on BuzzFeed. But most internet advertising is specifically designed to interrupt and to distract us from what we were trying to do when we chose to visit that website in the first place. People also dislike the way that adverts slow down page loading times. Now, of course, most of the time, the communication between a website and a third-party ad server only adds on a second or two to loading times, so that might sound a little bit like a first-world problem. However, research from Ericsson has shown that when people suffer from delays or buffering in loading web content, they experience the same levels of stress that they experience when they're watching a horror movie or when they're trying to solve a maths problem. So it's clear to see why they get so frustrated with ads slowing down their internet activities. Our frustrations aren't just psychological though. People also worry about the costs involved in loading ad content. And that might sound a bit counterintuitive because advertising still funds the majority of free content on the web. But the problem is that, especially when we experience slow page loading times, we're reminded of the fact that ad content requires data, which most of us still have to pay for. And this is particularly important in developing nations where data is still relatively expensive and where the amount that people spend to have access access to mobile data still represents a relatively important percentage of their monthly outgoings. People also voiced concerns about the security of their online activities, whether that relates to governments, corporations or criminals tracking their behaviour, or the potential threats from viruses and malware. However, by far the most common reason that people cite for blocking ads is the fact that most advertising is utterly dismal. It's poor quality, it's intrusive, it's not targeted, and it has very little relevance to our lives. So when you look at those five points in combination, it's clear to see why, when they're given the choice, people do choose to use ad blocking tools. The awkward reality is that online advertising is consistently interrupting and corrupting people's internet experiences. But the problems these interruptions create go much deeper than the challenges that advertisers face when they're trying to deliver individual ads to their audiences. The data from Global Web Index also shows that the use of ad blockers is still increasing around the world. And as that use does increase, it gets harder and harder for publishers to make money from ad-supported websites. And because of that, slowly but surely, 
these sites are being suffocated. In fact, it's almost inevitable that many of these sites won't be able to survive if the use of ad blockers continues at current rates. That's clearly of great concern to the publishers themselves, but it's even more worrying for advertisers because they rely on these ad-funded sites to deliver their marketing messages. If advertisers don't act soon, there is a very real danger that the whole ad-funded model will completely collapse. That means that almost all of these sites will disappear, and as a result, marketers simply won't have the opportunity to deliver advertising on the internet anymore. This is a problem that our industry needs to address as a matter of urgency. But when it comes to the responsibility for that action, many marketers seem to be getting confused. The answer is not to force publishers to find ways around ad blockers. People use ad blockers because most of the advertising our industry is producing is utter rubbish, and we need to take responsibility for that. So, rather than making ad blocking a problem for media owners, it's up to advertisers to address people's frustrations and to deliver advertising that is actually deserving of people's attention. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is by completely rethinking our approach to marketing. Of course, the critical question here once again is how, but the good news is that the answer is incredibly simple. We need to focus on creating marketing that people care about, marketing that actively adds value to people's lives. But how do we do that? Well, there are two ways that we can think about adding value to people's lives. The first is to help people solve their problems, help them address the things that keep them awake at night. This isn't just about telling people that our products or services will fix their issues though. It's about actually helping people to understand how they can solve the underlying problems too. So, for example, don't just tell people that your detergent washes whiter than ever before. Instead, show them how to remove stubborn stains or how to store clothes properly to avoid unpleasant odours. Use advertising to communicate audience-centric benefits and not product-centric attributes. The alternative approach is to fuel people's passions, to help them to understand how they can do more of what they love or to do it better. Now, this could involve something very practical, such as providing how-to videos on the internet, but it could also translate into much larger scale activities. A great example of this is the participative sports events that Nike organises as part of its marketing, like the 10k runs and the mass workout sessions that it hosts in cities all over the world. Critically though, we need to change the way we think about the value that marketing delivers. Most marketers still think of value in very transactional terms, but we don't need to wait until we make a sale before we can add value to people's lives. In fact, the best marketing starts to add value from the very first interaction. If you like, it's generous. It's marketing that gives people something before it asks them for something in return. And, just as we saw in the previous episode of Inspiring Marketing, we can use every element of our marketing mix to deliver that value too. So don't just focus on how your products or services help solve people's problems or help them indulge in their passions. Ask yourself how every element of your marketing mix, from your packaging, to your advertising, to your customer service, even your recruitment ads, can add value to your audiences through every interaction. And by doing that, our marketing is much more likely to be accepted and perhaps even welcomed by our audiences. And that leads us to the key tip for this episode. It's time for marketers to stop advertising at people and start finding ways to add value to those people's lives instead. Now, if you've got any questions about this episode, or if you'd like to discuss any of the ideas that it's inspired, please feel free to get in touch with me on social media. You'll find me as Eskimon on both LinkedIn and Twitter. And if you'd like to download the slides from this episode, you'll also find them on kepios.com, and I've shared the exact URL for today's content in the description section for this video on YouTube. And if you enjoyed this show, you'll find loads more presentations like this on the Inspiring Marketing YouTube channel. Just click or tap on any of the images on the screen here to watch other episodes in this series, or to subscribe to the channel and get a notification when I upload new videos. But that's all for today. Thanks very much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Inspiring Marketing.